My name's Steve, and today we're going to talk about fall. The main cause of all weather on the planet Earth is unequal solar heating due to the tilt of the Earth's axis. In June, the sun shines more directly on the northern hemisphere, and in December on the southern hemisphere. So naturally, as the days continue to get shorter and shorter here in the northern hemisphere, there's less and less radiation being received by the sun. The thing is, it's September 15th, and it's 83 degrees outside right now. It still really feels like summer. We are before the equinox, however, which is the day when the sun shines directly on the equator that occurs on September 22nd and March 21st. That doesn't fully explain the temperature discrepancy though. If the weather truly only depended on solar heating, then you would get the exact same average temperature on March 21st as September 22nd because the sun is in the exact same spot. Clearly that's not the case. If you look at the historical average temperatures for Cleveland, you can see on September 21st, we have 71 degrees Fahrenheit, while on March 21st, it's only 48. The short and sweet answer as to why seasons seem to linger is that there's so many competing forces in the atmosphere that are all trying to be in balance, resisting change. So naturally, temperature changes over a large scale take a long time. That being said, let's take a look at how fall sweeps across the United States. The Midwest, from Texas up to the Dakotas and east to Ohio, are very hot and humid up until about late July. To the north over Canada sits the polar jet stream, a band of extremely fast moving wind about 30,000 feet up that most of the time acts like a border between the warm and the cold air, the cold air always being to the north. The jet stream is like a snake. It never really moves straight. It dives, it lifts, it has small troughs and big troughs. It can be very narrow or it can be very wide. Whenever the jet stream dives down south, it brings the cold air down with it. Whenever it lifts north, it brings the warm air up. The temperature difference between the north and south edge of the jet is called the temperature gradient. You see this image? This is a color gradient from black to white. You could say that this is a large gradient. The color changes over a very large area. This, on the other hand, is a very tight gradient. There's a much smaller area of change. We can use the phrase tight gradient to describe an area that changes drastically in temperature. When the polar front has a very tight gradient, this can cause a cyclone to form, which ultimately involves the jet stream diving southward, bringing cold air with it. Throughout the entirety of summer, the polar jet stays just to the north in Canada. But one day, the temperature gradient gets really tight, a cyclone forms, the jet stream dives to the south, bringing cooler air in the realm of 65 degrees to the upper Midwest. Montana, the Dakotas, Minnesota, and Wisconsin are the first to get hit with a dose of fall. The surrounding states can still feel the effect though in the form of much lower humidity, which is greatly appreciated. And then the polar jet lifts back up to the north and you think, huh, maybe it is still summer. But then a week later, it happens again. And this time maybe the cold air reaches Ohio and Michigan. Maybe the air is cool enough to where it spawns lake effect showers and possibly even some water spouts over the Great Lakes something that hasn't been seen since the previous April. And a few days later, when that polar jet lifts, maybe it's not as warm as it once was. Maybe it's only 75 instead of 80. Once this summer pattern is disturbed, it creates a cycle of diving and lifting and diving and lifting. And that average temperature starts to creep down, starting with the northern Midwest. By the beginning of October, average temperatures in the northern Midwest are around 60 degrees. This is about the time when deciduous trees decide to shut down for the off season. The main reason why leaves change color is because there's less sunlight, and while cooler temperatures do play a role, it is secondary, a mere backseat driver to the loss of daylight. By October 1st in Cleveland, we are getting three hours and 20 minutes less daylight than in mid-June. That means less life-sustaining nutrients for plants. That's also why peak fall color estimations are usually pretty accurate, going by latitude. Let's look at one now. So here's a pretty low resolution image of AccuWeather's fall foliage peak color map. Come on. Thank you, weather. It's all pixelated. The diving color gradient that you see in the eastern half of the United States lines up pretty well with the jet stream pattern that occurs typically from late fall to early spring. There's usually a trough over the eastern United States keeping it fairly cold. The weird protruding red shape that you see in this part of the image correlate with the Appalachian Mountains, and it's actually part of a phenomenon called cold air damming. I have a separate video on that, and it's a really cool phenomenon. I highly recommend you check it out in the card above. And of course, the colder air associated with higher elevations is really going to expedite the changing of fall colors, which is why the peaks of the Rockies in Colorado and up to the northwest of Yellowstone, and even the Black Hills of South Dakota, are going to see colors change relatively early. So what about the rest of the United States? What about 
The Pacific Northwest, for example. Well, the Rockies are strategically placed to block most of the cold air from getting west of Nevada. But the polar jet sinking south still has a gradual effect on the average temperature. Colder air slowly sinks down into Washington and Oregon, while places like San Francisco and LA see minimal change. Thank you guys for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more weather videos. Peace.